Welcome to another edition of Why Wasn't It Better. I'm Patrick Darms. And I'm Anton Paras. And this is the podcast where we discuss hyped up, somewhat disappointing films. We're going to introduce a film, tell you why it was chosen, tell you how it got made, and then provide a few reasons that answer the question, why wasn't it better? Should we start with some admin? Yeah, let's go for it. Um, uh, why don't you uh, take it from here, Pat? Yeah, so we are recording these completely out of order at this point, so we apologize for any continuity issues. But uh, yeah, you can always reach us at wwibpodcast at gmail.com. That's wwibpodcast at gmail.com. And we have our own Twitter account at this point. It is at wwibpodcast. We still have done absolutely nothing with the Twitter account. I don't know what to do with the Twitter account. But the fact that we have one is... Uh, you know, noteworthy. Yeah, follow, tweet us. Yeah. All the feedback that you feel that you need to give, you give. It's probably better to give feedback in the email format because uh, I don't check the Twitter account very often. It's less than once a week. Um, but what are you going to do? We don't have any followers at this point anyway, so who cares? But for all the <laughs> feedback that we have received so far... Uh, we appreciate it. We're trying to incorporate as much into it as we record these, you know, films uh, as we can. Some of the feedback we're just completely disregarding, though, because it's trash. Right. And our opinions at the end of the day are ours. And yeah. we respect others' opinions as well. But this is our podcast, and we're not afraid to say what we're going to say. Right. You know, like the last, the, technically the second movie we reviewed was The Dark Knight Rises. A lot of people like that movie. I, I'm pretty lukewarm on it. Although I did give it a C plus, which is better than average. But if you like that movie, good for you. Because the movie that we're talking about today is a movie, Anton, that you chose. And I always had a fondness for this movie. But, you know, doing the research for it, it's not particularly well loved it's liked by some loved by few but i'd say disliked by a lot of people the movie that you chose anton is tron legacy yes i did let's get derezzed let's hop into the grid and yeah, I'll, see I'll, uh, what legacy what legacy did tron legacy leave well i'll do the intro for you and then tee you up so tron legacy was released on December 17th, 2010, by Walt Disney Pictures. It was directed by Joseph Kaczynski, his very first movie that he directed. Screenplay was written by Edward Kitsis and Adam Horowitz, with additional story credits for Brian Klugman and Lee Sternthal. The movie stars Garrett Hedlund, Jeff Bridges, Olivia Wilde, Bruce Boxleitner, James Frain, and Michael Sheen. Budget of $170 million and... $400 million is what it grossed at the box office. Tron Legacy is, here's a brief synopsis, Sam Flynn, the son of famous video game developer Kevin Flynn, has been haunted for a long time by his father's mysterious disappearance. A strange signal draws Sam to his father's arcade, and he is pulled into the same cyber world in which his father, its creator, has been trapped for 20 years. With fearless warrior Korra, Kevin and Sam seek to escape from a universe that, while magnificent, is far more advanced and dangerous than Kevin had ever imagined. Anton, why have you chosen this movie for this podcast? So, there is always a fondness for films that dive into, that dive into legacy, that dive into the strength of the film that preceded it sequels always have a huge draw. And I thought the original Tron while looking a bit dated, it was very innovative for its time. And for me, it was a very enjoyable film. And so of course, uh, while not one of the all time great Disney movies, it was very interesting and one of the most important. So people are aware of the importance in terms of it's being the first film to feature those extensive computer generated imagery. And for a lot of kids, and I'm, I'm sure for you as well, captivated by that, captivated Definitely. by what they're able to include. 
Yeah, um, that, it's completely unique. The original movie that the the first film it's unique. It features visual style that's net probably like I don't think it's ever been used before, and most of the criticism um, is centered on the acting and the story. Um, I appreciate it for what it was. I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. And to this day, um, there really hasn't been anything like it. Um, it's very, very much uh, a trailblazer in terms of what Disney put out. It represented a time in Disney's history when they were willing to take more creative risks. And it's one of those movies where you just never thought that there would be a sequel. So they finally released like uh, notes in terms of putting one out in 0708. Very exciting, right? A lot of people don't know what to think. This is an IP that hasn't been touched in years. Patrick, you, you, I, I think you saw the the teaser uh, that was made for Comic Con. What was your initial reaction? Well, I, I, I was pretty caught off guard by that teaser. I remember seeing it on YouTube sometime after it premiered at Comic Con, and I was, I was excited for it. But at the same time, this was. A, around the same time that the fourth Indiana Jones movie came out, and I was pretty soured on long-awaited sequels. So I didn't have high expectations for the sequel. I was excited, but wary at the same time. Because like you, I really liked the movie, the original Tron, as a kid. And even today, you know, you mentioned it is dated, but it's dated in the best way. It really is a unique-looking movie. I still haven't really seen anything like it. And yeah, the story was silly. The acting was its pretty much on par for what you'd expect from a PG-rated Disney movie. But your point about this it coming out at an interesting time in Disney's history, I think it's a really good one because it's easy to forget now because Disney's just such a behemoth. But they came really close to bankruptcy at one point during the 80s. And the original oh, yeah, Tron... Definitely. It was it was definitely a creative risk for them, and it did not make that much money at the box office. It became a cult movie over time, and that's eventually why we ended up getting this sequel. But these Tron movies, they're they're sort of an IP that I I don't really think Disney was really knew what to do with it because the original movie and I think this movie too, you kind of either love it or hate it, you know? Right, and. Even with that, it's a lot of people like being able to come back to the franchise after so long, especially younger folks who probably were the are like a huge demographic. They're they're a huge demographic, right? For Disney films. Oh, yeah. They have no idea what Tron is or who Tron is (laughs) or what the franchise is. I it's it's such a strange. Did you see this in the theater? I did. I did. Yeah. So when I went to see it, I had a couple of my friends that, that were excited for it like I was, but we saw it, I was in college at the time, and we saw it with this big group of people. Most of the people that we went to see it with didn't even realize it was a sequel. And they were all right. the same age as me, so you'd think they would have at least been aware of Tron. Obviously, Tron came out before both of us were born, but of course, when you're a kid seeing it in the 90s, it's not an old, old movie. It, was, you know, it wasn't brand new at the time, but yeah, I, it's, it's an interesting IP for Disney. Very interesting and good to, good to revisit. But I maybe this was something like th- this is something that has been touched on through various articles. Was this a movie ahead of its time? And I think that even just the concept in itself, there would probably were better ways to reintroduce that to like a larger audience. Yeah. Or how do we ease in fans? I into think the original the certainly IP. was ahead of its time. Even then, let's uh. Let's think. Let's think of that. Let's think of um, Tron. Uh, let's think of the Tron franchise and think of Tron Legacy, and let's enter into that production history. Uh, Patrick, will you will you take us through? Absolutely. So the original Tron was produced and directed by a guy named Steve Lisberger. He was sort of the guy that thought up the idea for the you know original story of Tron, but he was not the main driver in this sequel actually getting made. He was kind of around in behind the scenes for it, but he didn't direct it. He didn't write it. He didn't produce it. So a bit more on the original. We touched on this 
But just to give like the hard facts, the original Tron was released in 1982. It got mixed critical praise and it only earned $33 million at the box office. So I think mm-hmm. it, it made a little bit of money for Disney, but it wasn't what they expected. Over the years, its reputation grew as a cult film. And it's probably one of the most well-loved cult movies from the 80s. Now, there had been rumors circulating about a a possible sequel for a long time, and they finally got ignited in 2003 with the release of the first-person player video game Tron 2.0, which I remember quite fondly. I haven't played it since it came out 20 years ago, but I really liked it at the time. You played it on Xbox? I played it on the PC. I remember playing it on Xbox. It was fun. I thought it was really yeah, fun. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that should be a video game, right? Right. So the game had a very warm reception. And I th- that's probably what spurred Disney to explore making a sequel. Because in 2005, the studio hired Brian Klugman and Lee Sternthal, a pair of screenwriters, to write the script. In a Variety magazine article, Klugman said of the original film, quote, we are contemporizing it, taking ideas that were ahead of the curve and applying them to the present. And we feel the film has a chance to resonate to a younger audience, end quote. These two writers, they, of course, consulted Steve Lisberger, wanting to get his blessing. And he approved of their story idea. And he, but Lisberger himself, he deliberately chose not to get involved in the production as he felt that the computer industry had evolved so much over the previous 30 years, or it would have been 20 plus at that point, that it, it was best for a younger team to present their interpretation. The story mm-hmm. featured a lot of religious themes, particularly those relating to Christianity and Buddhism. Now, the character that Olivia Wilde would play in the movie, Cora, that character was inspired by the historical Catholic figure Joan of Arc, according to the research. A little uh, little heady stuff here. Now, the character of Clue, which would be played by a younger digital version of Jeff Bridges, was created as an evil embodiment to, quote, how you look back on your younger self. That guy thought he knew everything, but in reality, he knew nothing, end quote. Jeff Bridges liked the idea of the dual perspectives, and he contributed with the writers for the characterization of Flynn as a sort of Zen master by suggesting them to get inspiration from various Buddha texts. I think it's pretty cool that Jeff Bridges was in on this even before they started pre-production. He must have had a lot of fun making the first one because he was all in on this from early on. And he was in that teaser that they made for Comic-Con. He did that for no money. But uh, l- let's try to think in terms of uh, how how in tune with Zen it was, especially <laughs> were, were they were they weighing into that, especially that introduction scene where you see we see he's meditating. It's like we get it. He's he's Zen. He uh, he had he had to figure out some way to meditate because he was stuck in there a long time. <laughs> right. And, and it looked like uh, there wasn't really much to do out there unless go to raves. Yes, and I have a um, <laughs> I have a note about that a little bit later. <laughs> so, <laughs> back to the production history. Uh, producer Sean Bailey, who would eventually, after this movie came out, he would become president of Walt Disney Studios. He had always been a big fan of the original movie, and he had a he had a major hand in getting this sequel made. He ended up approaching screenwriting duo Adam Horowitz and Edward Kitsis. They accepted the uh, the you know the project because they were obsessed about Tron, just like him. Horowitz later claimed that the challenge was a quote homage to the first movie to continue the story, expand on it, and take it to another place and open up space for new fans. And Kitsis claimed that the film would start a whole new mythology that would only scratch the surface. In two thousand seven, this is around the time where they come up with the idea for the the comic-con teaser bailey approached joseph kaczynski about directing the film and he pitched it to to him with the question quote in a post matrix world how do you go back to the world of tron end quote i can't find a ton of evidence or not evidence but i can't find a ton of info on why the studio sought out kaczynski to direct this because I mentioned this in the intro he this is his first movie he had never directed anything before he had done a lot of commercials So that's probably how he got on their radar. But Kaczynski, now, of course, he would later go on. He, like last year, he directed the 
very famous, very successful Top Gun Maverick. So he's had a pretty good career since this. Kaczynski, he wanted to embrace the general ambiance of the film, and he wished not, he didn't want to use the internet as a model uh, or use anything that was uh, evocative of the Matrix. It's an intelligent decision on their part. Um, they were, <laughs> Kaczynski asked ba Bailey to lend him money in order to create a conceptual prototype of the Tron universe, which was eventually what got presented at the 2008 Comic-Con. It got a lot of buzz at Comic-Con, and while the trailer did not confirm that a Tron sequel was absolutely going to be made, it showed that Disney was serious about making a sequel. And it was later that year in 2008 when Disney officially greenlit the project. Now, Kaczynski is a former architect, and he brought his architectural knowledge to conceptualizing the Tron Legacy universe. The look for the grid, where the movie is for the most part set, it was aimed for a more advanced version of the cyberspace visited by Flynn in the original movie, which Lisberger said he described it as, quote, a virtual Galapagos, which has evolved on its own, end quote. And Bailey also put that the grid would not have any influence from the Internet. They really were adamant about not having any influence from the Internet. And, you know, they wanted this to be an environment that grew on its own server into something completely unique. And to make the simulation more realistic, because, you know, this this grid in this movie it doesn't really look anything like what we see in the original movie. That's because of special effects, of course. And they kind of described it as it was um, an environment that just evolved over time on its own and kept improving itself. That's how you get the environmental effects in the grid, such as rain and wind. And the design makes team... Sense. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. The design team on the film, they considered light a major part of the Tron look. <coughs> particularly for being set in a dark world. And one of the art directors described it as, quote, dark silhouetted objects dipped in an atmosphere with clouds in between in a kind of Japanese landscape painting, end quote. I thought that was a pretty cool way to describe it. Lighting was spread through every prop on the set, including the floor on Flynn's hideout. Now, a little bit of casting here. Before Garrett Hedlund was cast as Sam Flynn, other actors that were considered included Casey Affleck, Chris Pine, Ryan Gosling, and Michael Stahl David. I don't know who Michael Stahl David names. is. You know who he is? No, but uh, the names I did recognize, good names. They are. Casey Affleck got pretty close to getting this role. He was in negotiations to take the role before scheduling conflicts pre prevented the deal from going any further, and that's how Garrett Hedlund got the role. Now, Olivia Wilde, she beat out hundreds of other actresses to audition for the role of Cora. And, of course, Jeff Bridges, as we know, he was in on this pretty early. He seemed like, you know, he was pretty gung-ho to do this. And worth noting, so I mentioned the budget of $170 million. That is the most expensive film ever made by a first-time director. Wow. Yeah. So they, they really trusted Kaczynski with this. You know, the guy had only done commercials. It kind of reminds me of David Fincher's first movie was Alien 3. Mm, like he had he had David Fincher, he had done a lot of really famous music videos, a lot of really well received commercials, and he just, he got trusted with making the third movie in, in the Alien franchise. We will absolutely be covering Alien 3 at some point. Because that is a movie that <laughs> <laughs> Should have been way better than what it was. Yeah. Sad how that turned out. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. You you an alien franchise fan? I am the first two. Yeah. So the I, I uh, But I'll i I'll, I'll still watch each one as they come out, like Prometheus uh, and then the sequels. I still watch them. But oh, wait, wait do you hear the first two are like the best. Oh, we're gonna do Prometheus too. Yeah, the first two <laughs> When people ask me if I'm an Alien fan, I say no, because I only like two of the movies, and there's like eight at this point. Counting and mathematically like the stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm just, I feel like if you only like two out of eight, can you really say you're a fan? It's like, eh. Absolutely. You can still appreciate like the property for what it is. You could still like Star Wars, but not love three out of the six films. I'm glad you said six. I'm not acknowledging. No, <laughs> no. 
Did I tell you I've I've never seen the last two sequel movies? Just didn't see them. And there's no reason to. <laughs> oh, that's that's what everybody tells me. But <laughs> back to Tron Legacy. Um, the movie was filmed primarily in Vancouver, beginning in April 2009. Filming lasted 67 days, and it was shot digitally, just like James Cameron's Avatar, which had come out the year before. Here's the big part. The part, the part we all love. Kaczynski and music supervisor Jason Bentley, they approached Daft Punk early on and requested that the duo compose the score to this movie. Amazing decision. It's, it's just, we're going to talk about the score later on, but I'd like to talk about it briefly here. It's just, it's astounding. It's one of my favorite scores ever. And every time that I start rewatching this movie, I get chills hearing the opening grid overture. It's oh, oh, fantastic. It's- it's it's a soundtrack that has such staying power. It's just so cool and was the perfect decision for the film. I don't know what I would compare it to, but it's one of the best creative decisions ever made for any major blockbuster. It really is. Yeah. I feel like on this podcast, we have a weird relationship with the Academy Awards. This score did not even get nominated for Best Original Score. That's embarrassing for the Academy yeah. Awards. It's... It's another reason why, like, I mean, very timely, the Academy Awards just occurred. Those of you who are listening and trying to figure out our timeline, um, the Academy Awards just happened like this past, uh, you know, a few days ago. There is never going to be a true, like, it's, they're never going to truly capture, like, intrinsic value of these films that get released because it's always going to be a popularity contest and who, who is... In be- who is in the best relationships with the Academy directors and uh, and decision makers? But that's my that that's me on my soapbox. I don't have to continue on with it. I'm sure our listeners would rather hear us talk about why wasn't this film better? Well, and Anton, with- you you. <laughs> You chose this movie, so I'm please ready. kick us off. I'm ready. Okay. So uh, reason number one, listeners, the, 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 pro- the protagonist and the acting. And I, I, I want to set the stage by saying who here just loves Garrett Hedlund? Who loves the Garrett Hedlund film, just uh, filmography? Um, let's think about the iconic scenes in which um, the main protagonist of the film um, was able to sell with such conviction and passion. Listeners, if you haven't caught on already, I am not a huge fan (laughs) of who they cast um, to be the protagonist of this film. Uh, There's, there's no going around it. I mean, it's, especially when you're comparing to the original film, uh, who was it? None other than legend, um, the the charismatic and dynamic Jeff Bridges. Um, Jeff Bridges, of course, uh, being one of my favorite actors, actually, from of all time. Played a very underrated villain in the Iron Man film. And, of course, the dude. But He's, he's been in so much. He's been in so much. And unlike Garrett Hedlund. Unlike <laughs> Garrett, Garrett Hedlund, Hedlund, yeah. I think he was like an extra in Troy or something. He was in um, Troy, yes. <laughs> probably a bigger part than I am exaggerating. I mean, I um, only know that because of the research for this movie. But I was like, oh, yeah, he was in Troy. Right. But it's even today, like not a very not a very relevant actor. Um, not to say that maybe there was more strategy in having uh, having him in this film, in this particular role. Uh but he just do, did not have the chops to be a, the like lead in this film. Very, very bland. Would you agree with that, Patrick? Yes. He doesn't. He he certainly doesn't ruin the movie for me. But he does not have the acting chops. Now, is this a movie that requires Oscar caliber acting? No. But I got serious like uh, Abercrombie and Fitch model vibes from him. Like when um after he pulls the prank at Encom and he goes home and Bradley's waiting for him. He's like, hi, Alan. Thanks for coming, Alan. Why are you here, Alan? What do you want, Alan? <laughs> he's, he's to your, to your point, he is very bland. But 
I, I one one could say maybe this was a justification on the part of the of the studio to say let's put a name out there that we can build a franchise off of. Let's put someone out there with a blank slate that looks good, handsome, can be a good lead in the film and really carry it. Eh, just I, I would have preferred Ryan Gosling or Chris Pine. Right. He just wasn't but who went on to do fantastic films over the years. But for Tron, yeah, we and, got Gary. Yeah. Yeah. It, he's uh, part of the issue is that he's surrounded by better actors. Like any scene he's in with Jeff Bridges, he's just being completely outclassed. Like Olivia Wilde, better actress, even when he's around some of the um, smaller roles, like the, the Michael Sheen performance, James Frain. Who plays um, Jarvis, like Clue's right. like assistant guy? He's he's just surrounded by better actors in pretty much every scene he's in. Now we've seen this happen in other movies where sometimes it actually hurts a movie when better actors are surrounded by or when better actors are surrounding the protagonist, and that's that is sort of what happens here. Unlike the original film, it's inverted. Bridges was by far the best actor in that movie. Now, apart from legendary character actor David Warner, who plays three different roles in the original Tron, can you name them all? Tron? No, he doesn't play Tron. Who played Tron? Bruce Boxleitner. Ah, there we go. So David Warner played Edward Dillinger Sr. He played Commander Sark. And he was the voice of the master control. Oh, okay, okay. Very good tidbit for us yeah. and for and for my ignorance. Oh, it's not ignorance. It's just it's a pretty deep cut. But I, look, I hear you about Gary Hedlund. I, I would say to defend him a little bit, he does. He is athletic, and he sells the physicality of the role when he's. When he's in the disc wars and he's on the bike, he he has that part of the performance down. That looks natural to him. Yeah. Like if you ever seen him, if you ever, I'm trying to think of an example and I'm I'm struggling to. But there's sometimes there's movies where they have an actor fighting and it's clear that they've never had any fight training or they don't know how to fight. At least Headland looks the part when he's on the bike and he's throwing the disc around. He he sells the physicality of the role. He looks comfortable doing that. That's true. I think they kind of set that this is someone that can do, like, if he can parachute off a building, he can fight in a, yeah, in a in a disc battle. But I think it was, and this is a, probably more on the on on the plot. But I wasn't necessarily convinced that this is someone that was going to step into the arena and just quickly pick up, being able to compete in these, uh, you know, different like events he did learn that stuff real quick the motorcycle was, thing i buy was, but the, the disc insane. war part the, of the it the motorcycle yeah that's fine but yeah being able to like just do ninja flips and like react as quickly <laughs> as he can um I, I don't know if that really sold me but anyway um it's it's enough of <laughs> enough of uh headland right it's a. Uh, it's very much clear that um, he hasn't been in anything uh, really since Tron or nothing that has had such major headlines as Tron. (sighs) Uh, Yeah. I think you're right about that, but can I in slightly in his defense, maybe you disagree. I think it's a worse movie with Casey Affleck in the role. I don't see Casey, Casey Affleck in this movie at all. I <laughs> no because Casey Affleck has the Casey Affleck has the body of a scarecrow, and I don't yeah. I don't think he would look as good uh, no. in like that skin tight bodysuit. So maybe think, that's what Garrett had going for him. I just it, I saw the Ryan Gosling. I know we mentioned Gosling and Pine. I. I would have much preferred either one of them. But, like, look, do you think we can get Garrett Hedlund on the podcast? He's probably available. Oh, I'm sure. Do you have a roll of quarters laying around? <laughs> I do. I do. 
Uh, as far as far as the other performances in the movie, did you like those? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we 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 touched on Bridges. Um, yeah, he's great. Huge, great gravitas. Every scene, very limited screen time, but that's to the benefit of the film. You get yeah a you you get a nice treat whenever you see Bridges on screen, and uh, really a different uh, a different character type compared to his character in the first film, which is a nice evolution. It was really more of a the older mentor Yoda type, right? Or maybe like even like a, a, a Gandalf-esque wizard, um, but really someone more in tune with himself and is able to provide more just guidance for this his very scrappy young, uh, young man. Young Padawan. But, uh, ooh, D- digital breath, Jeff Bridges, um, the uncanny valley to the max. Yeah, it looks like he stepped off the Polar Express. It, it's not. Yeah. It has. It hasn't aged well. It really hasn't. <laughs> it's not. It's not. I mean, it. I don't think there. It was at the area of CGI films trying to capture human characteristics, even s- at a level that wasn't creepy. Like it was still very creepy. You you touched on Polar Express, very creepy. Um, yeah. The 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 Final Fantasy film from the two thousands, very creepy. Yeah, it's it is an interesting decision on their part to use digital Jeff Bridges. Um, I are there really have they ever really mastered this technique at this point though? I don't know that they have. I think like I was impressed by what I saw in the Irishman. It I thought that was really cool um, just to see the de aging effects. Maybe not. It's hard. I think it's gotten gone a long way, and especially actually even in a uh, Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I think that was the first film I saw where I was like, oh, they've really gotten a lot better at this. Not perfect. Not to say that it was still like not creepy to see like. <laughs> some scenes I, I, actually benjamin button preceded this movie yeah i don't agree with you about the irishman though i i yeah i hate that movie Oof. i'm dreading doing that movie on this podcast because we're gonna have to because people were excited for it i'm not one of them oh it's man it's like three and a half hour snooze fest but yeah, I, I'm th- this digital Jeff Bridges. It is a, it is a, it's a significant weak link. I love, I loved Olivia Wilde. She's one of the highlights. Oh yeah, great, uh, great presence, fun presence, and in a film with a lot of very serious roles, someone that really added good liveliness to the film. Michael Sheen, what do you think? Because he, he has a small oh, but very memorable role as Kester. Very, very small. Um, I th- I thought I thought it was okay. Um, yeah, he's he's very David Bowie esque, and it's but memorable. It... But it feels like he's in a different movie. But was it written like? Is it just that how it was written? And because I honestly thought it was like see, uh, scenes with uh, Sheen in it, it maybe just didn't make sense in the context. And that's why we have less like more of a soured taste. I think it may have been written in a particular way. He was certainly hamming it up and he, he was dialing it up to 11 the whole time. Everybody else was kind of like at a five or six. He was at 11. I just I feel like he was in a different movie. It, it, the performance didn't work for me. Yeah, I mean, you can see those David Bowie elements, right? But uh, oh yeah, they I, weren't I, hiding. I think it. that, but I, I think I, I, even just the way that he reveals himself is like, yeah, I am Zeus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, I'm bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was just very much like, well, that's that sucks. That was a horrible reveal. Best thing was probably the fact that he owns the club that Daft Punk DJs in. The end of Line Club. The end of Line Club, which is also a fantastic track. Oh yeah, there's not a bad track on that soundtrack. We've been we've been dropping names, I've, uh, listeners. Listen to D Res. Listen to 
end of line. Oh, uh, I have but, a whole list of my favorite ones later in my notes. Uh, bring us, uh, bring us to uh, reason number two, Pat. The second reason why this wasn't better, I would say, my biggest issue with this movie is the plot. I, you would agree with me. the 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 premise, the story, the setting, the concept of this movie is an awesome one, right? Right. It's one of the things that I think people find appealing about these movies, just the, the concept of existing in a digital world. It's pretty cool. But the plot of this movie has some pretty big holes in it, and every time I watch it, I do notice them more. The movie's called Tron, and Tron himself is not in this very much. Nope, not very, very s- small. Or we don't see, quote-unquote, Tron. Spoiler for... <laughs> right in case no one's seen this movie now i of all the plot holes we're going to talk about a couple of them are answered in this handy dandy novelization of the movie that i happen to own just so you get a good look at it there listeners can't see this but i'm just proudly displaying this to anton on camera great cover very great cover. very fun cover now this this plot hole that I'm about to bring up it does get answered in the novelization but they don't really address it in the movie which is how did Flynn survive for so long on the grid 20 years in our world is like I think it's the equivalent of like thousands of years in the grid now he's able to create food and water because he's the creator of the world so that's how he's able to survive but the movie doesn't really answer that here's the big one that I had and I I had, I asked of a few of our friends what their thoughts were because I was like, maybe I missed something. Maybe someone has the answer to this. This is my big problem with the plot. How did Alan Bradley and others not realize that Flynn was trapped on the grid? I thought in the first film, it established that Bradley and, and Lori, La- Laura, Lori, whatever, I thought that they were aware of, of Flynn's trips to the grid. Like, did it never occur to Bradley or even young Sam? Did it never occur to them to look for Flynn on the grid? Like Sam for sure knew that his dad was going inside the grid. Like, did he not tell anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Can, can we also just observe for the fact that that arcade was kept in perfect condition all these years, no one's found that secret door and all the machines still work fine. Who was paying the electric bill? Right, and, and no one's tried to break in. That looked like a pretty seedy neighborhood in Tron Legacy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty convenient. I did like that '80s touchscreen though; pretty badass. <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah. How did Clue send the page to Alan's pager if the grid is completely disconnected from the internet or any landline? So, because Flynn, Flynn tells Sam that Clue must have sent the page, right? But Clue himself never actually confirms this. It's never brought <laughs> they, up again. They, they never, bring, they it never bring it up again. No, no. Doesn't confirm nor deny that that was any any reason for his so called scheme. Which what was his scheme in the long run? Oh, we'll get to his scheme. Another thing I noticed. Does Clue control Rinsler? I'm not sure because he seems to be controlling something with those two balls during the disc battle. Now, shout out to my friend Tyler who pointed out to me that Clue is probably controlling the arena like when it when it turns over. But it's shot in such a way that it makes you think like he's controlling Rinsler in some way. Cuz but of course later on Rinsler seems to be acting on his own and here's here's the other plot whole question that I have, how is Rinsler, or in this case, Tron, how is Tron, how does he manage to overcome Clue's corruption of him? He sort of just sees Flynn on the light jet in the finale, and he decides to fight for the users again. It's kind of a huge plot point that doesn't get explained. And a horrible payoff, especially for such a pivotal character in the original film. To see that be the redemption, it's like no, like I thought it, it, was cool. it was just a very poor send off to to to. Try. I thought it was cool. I I really I still get hyped up when uh he falls, he's sinking into the sea, and you see his circuitry reset to like white. I was like, yes, 
part of I mean, part of me feels like there's got to be better payoff. Like act like yes, the action shows that there's been a switch of sides, but there's no opportunity to see them both and like see the main character and Tron compete together in some sort of like yeah, I hear you in some sort of callback. Like the, the, there was no, uh, there was nothing, but I, I hear you. It was a cool, it was cool. So there's no answer for that one. And then here's the big one. The ISOs just appearing. Now there, the idea of the ISOs is rooted in reality, like programs appearing in the form of like glitches. But I know this is probably your big issue with the plot they made this into something that would have had world shaking implications he's like science religion medicine they're really making this is a bit much it's just (laughs) you're just shaking your head it's like when you try to think about what is the the point of like the story being told what is like the deeper message is it trying to say the intrinsic value of life is it trying to say that like trying to look at um is it trying to say trying to look at like the art versus the creator but then throwing in like this idea of development of like the iso like the i feel like the whole iso plot line could have been cut from the film do you do you agree with me here and like yes it it doesn't contribute much to the 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 main plot of just Sam trying to escape the grid with his father. It's kind of a, it's in the, it, it, it's cause it's kind of a story that existed in what would be a prequel. And it gets touched on in the, the, you know, the, ser- the, the series that they released after this Tron uprising, it's touched on that more there. I, I agree with you. It doesn't have any bearing on our heroes getting back to the portal. It doesn't make clue any less evil genocide or otherwise. Yeah, I think it is the most questionable part of the plot, the the ice the ISO of it all. I I perceive it as trying to trying to find an element to make the main villain more devious, or trying to put add more weight to the film, but at the same time not using it to actually tie together like any message the film is trying to tell, or even any outcomes that are. That are uh, as that are dependent on ISOs or on that element in general. I don't know that they should have even tried to tell this bigger message. I don't think they needed to. That's not what most people went to this movie wanting or expecting. If this doesn't bother me as much as I think it bothers you, I went to this movie with such low expectations that I just wanted to be entertained, and I I ultimately was. But I think. Everything you're saying is totally fair. Some of the other plot holes, they make a big point of saying that Clue, if Clue escapes into the real world, it's, quote, game over. Like, how? How would no one right? in the real like world how? be able to With stop what? him? Anyone and could stop him. Do what? And, and do what? Yeah. He's not invincible. How's he going to get that army through the portal? I, they're hmm. like, oh, he doesn't dig perfection. It's like, well, or imperfect. He doesn't dig imperfection. It's like, yeah, but... Anyone in the real world could stop him. He could get mugged. Yeah, there there was nothing that would show that Clue had any powers that could translate into the real world that would be an issue for everyone. Right? He couldn't even create programs. He could only repurpose them. Yeah, so also takes away... That, that, that was definitely a head-scratcher. Yeah. And then... This is our connection to our the previous movie we reviewed, The Dark Knight Rises. Our boy Killian Murphy has a cameo early on in this movie as Ed Dillinger Jr., the son of none other than famous character actor David Warner. I was expecting Dillinger to resurface at some point, but he never did. It seems like they only put him in as a nod to the original film. Now, I did read that his appearance was meant to hint at a possible sequel, which they were going to make, but it never materialized. But at the same time, like waste of a very good actor for like basically yeah. just a wave at the screen. Yeah, uh, I, I well, the first time I saw it, I'm like, oh, surely he's going to show up at some point later in the movie, but he he never did. No, nope, but he was wearing glasses well, in the scene, and just yeah. Here, look, here's my big question for you, Anton. 
because you, you were you were like you know Flynn's been meditating. Good thing he's got that Zen thing. So he's stuck in the grid for a very long time. At what point did he start having sex with Cora? <laughs> Fifteen minutes, I mean, two weeks, a month. That's how many, why, how many it, cycles? It, it, Maybe that's why he was just so he he had a, such a level of self tran of transcendence, um, and being able to meditate because he's been banging Cora for years. You have any more reasons why this wasn't better? Yes, we we do, my friend. We do. Um, we we've touched on the plot, and now number three, the storytelling. Uh, this is a film that is just stunning. Uh, just beautiful visuals. It, it's able to capture the design of and aesthetics of the original film, but at the same time, just evolve it, modernize it, really bring it into its own, and in a way that modern, like uh, just special effects can and CGI can. And 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 for me, that that's that's awesome. Just to be able to see a film evolve like that because it really has been years. Um the the use of just the the use of the effects to be able to accentuate different forms of light being able to drive the the clean lines the architecture seeing that throughout the film really showed like they were care they took a lot of care and attention to how the film looked visually they absolutely nailed it um they everything did. about that universe i mean gorgeous right patrick they, they... I completely agree. This movie is an absolute joy to look at. the The lines of light, the architecture, the I, I think I mentioned to you in a text about this when I watched it a couple of weeks ago. Just everything has a, a this symmetrical geography to it. Right. All the ships, the suits, the sets, everything. They put a lot of thought into designing this movie, and it looks. Every bit is cool to me now as it did when I first saw it 13 years ago in the theaters. Kaczynski is a great visual director. You can you can absolutely get a sense that he was an architect before he started directing. His movies are really good to look at. He even um, what's the Tom Cruise movie he directed? Oblivion. It has that uh, this that has a really cool soundtrack similar to this by mm. M83. I wouldn't call it a great movie, but it's a pretty cool movie to look at. The director of photography on this is a gentleman named Claudio Miranda. He did a fantastic job. You can tell he knows how to work with CGI. He knows how to combine it with like practical cinematography. And before right, we get I'm... into like nitpicking stuff, I just want to highlight some things about the movie. This movie contains some of my all-time favorite shots. There's a at the end of the light cycle battle, I don't know if you can visualize this from your memory. There's an overhead shot of Rinzer's light bike exploding, and he just whips out a backup ba backup bike. It like it's doesn't so even face him, and it's all in slow motion. It's my favorite shot in the whole movie. And then Clue powering up his light bike, the shot of Flynn shutting down the end of line end of line club when he's in his like Jedi robe and everything goes dark. Tron circuitry reverting back to white. It's just, it is an astonishing movie to look at. Oh, beautiful. And like, even just that example of Tron circuitry reverting back to white, it's showed that there was a lot of care to the cinematography and being able yes. to use color, use color to help tell that story. So I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. For all the issues that you and I may have with the plot, and maybe some of the acting, they got all the technical aspects of this movie as perfect as they could. And this might be a bold statement. This is visually every bit as impressive as it is to me, as it is to Avatar the year before. Digital oh, Jeff okay. Bridges, yeah. that is what it is. But I think most of the CGI in this movie holds up stylistically. And it does have some of the most seamless like CGI blending I've seen. Again, not talking about digital death bridges. That is what it is. It's an example of style over substance. This whole movie. Mm, great way to put it. Do you want to continue to talk about Daft Punk a little bit? Because I do. That would be perfect to talk about. I've, I think I've talked about Daft Punk quite a bit. Um, why, why don't you... Uh, 
throw us in there, Patrick? I'm trying not to gush too much. The score really is a work of art. It, it's perfectly integrated into the movie, and it, it, it's almost to the point where entire sequences look, sound, and feel like music videos. It carries the movie. It's the best thing about the movie. It's probably the number one reason why this movie will continue to be remembered over the years is because of this score. And some of the tracks, they're all great, but the Sirens, Son of Flynn when he's riding a motorcycle, the End of Line Club song, d Solar Sailor, the Disc Wars theme when Sam is retrieving his father's disc, the finale when they're at the portal, that, that track's called Flynn Lives. It's it's just perfect music. I would pay an exorbitant amount of money to see an orchestra perform this movie live. And I do want to give a big shout out, obviously not just to Daft Punk, but to composer Joseph Trapanese, who arranged and orchestrated the whole score with Daft Punk over the course of two years. Considering they use an 85-piece orchestra, this is a big part of why it sounds so amazing. And look, if you ever needed another reason to hate the Academy Awards, you mentioned it in the intro, this, this score wasn't even nominated. This is right up there with Pacino not winning for Godfather 2, in my opinion. You hit every single nail on the head here. It's just, it, it is just such a, a, an amazing soundtrack that really was brought, I think, really brought to life this film. Like for um, oh, not yeah. only visually, but like paired, fan, like paired perfectly. Um, with these, with the beautiful shots that we see here in this film, and so there you have it. You have a beautiful setting, uh, a world captured in that is an evolution of the modern film, and showing the emphasis of light, ge- geometrical uh, symmetry, um, a care and attention to detail with the visuals of this film, and to how this uh, how it should sound. Where did it sour? <laughs> as far as the storytelling goes. Right. One of the criticisms that I that I've heard about this movie is that the dialogue is childish and cheesy. I think it's fair. The boardroom scene, the security guard on the roof, the taxi driver, another customer, bio digital jazz man, Michael Sheen's character. It's I think it's fair to criticize the dialogue. For all the bad dialogue, I think you do get some good stuff at the finale when Flynn tells Clue, this is a quote I really like. He says, the thing about perfection is that it's unknowable, it's impossible, but it's also right in front of us the whole time. You couldn't know that because I didn't know when I created you, end quote. I thought that was pretty validating, but I I do think the criticisms about the dialogue are valid. And it's no coincidence, we mentioned the screenwriters involved. Well, what's not credited is that Disney ended up bringing in Michael Arndt and John Lasseter to provide major rewrites to the film during reshoots when an early cut of the film proved lackluster. So they filmed the movie. Disney wasn't happy with what they saw, and they ended up redoing some stuff. That's expensive. (laughs) Yeah. But they'll do it. They did it. As far as some of the other storytelling goes, there was deleted scenes that involved Sam Flynn's mom. I don't think any of the deleted stuff's actually available. There's just, you know, you, you can just find like rumors of it online. I always got the impression with this whole movie that there was a lot more that we just never got to see. I think to your point, I think the filmmakers, they wanted us to think about some bigger picture stuff, but they didn't get to deliver the full message. Right. Something about the storytelling that I felt was very lazy was trying to be able to not trusting the audience to be able to catch on with effective storytelling visually. And what I'm trying to touch on there is, do you remember in the beginning of the film, how does it introduce everything? Exposition dialogue. Exposition dialogue. Is that effective? It can be, but more often it's used as a crutch. And absolutely, for a film like this, that's so visually stunning. Why focus so much on the first, like, five, what, five... 10 minutes of the film focus on just telling everyone what happened and already that's not setting a good tone for a film that really for all intents and purposes the visuals really were selling um were were really a huge seller for the film so even then it was just fair lackluster yeah i think that's fair there was there was just there's a lot of things in this movie that they hinted at but didn't really go into detail with 
in the end of line club scene, you get there's some kind of resistance revolution thing that's going on. You know, you you see some of the revolutionaries, they're trying to talk to Caster and they're like, we need to meet Zeus because the revolution needs to happen. They don't really go into any detail on it, though. There was a lot more that they could have done with that. Additionally, we move on from the Sam Kevin reunion pretty quickly. They have the dinner at, at Flynn's hideout. It's a pretty short scene. We get a nice bonding scene when they're on the solar sailor. And he, you know, he he's like, There's a war in the Middle East. Later Laker Celtics is, are back at it, which is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, but it's not much, and it's it's you know, we're on I I get it. We're like the portal's closing, we're on a time crunch thing. I always got the sense with this movie that there was more that we could have and possibly should have seen. Right. Ian Buckwalter of NPR, he says, quote, on one hand, this new outing wants to be dark, moody science fiction full of big ideas, but it's also ostensibly a kid's movie by a kid's studio, so it's obligated, obligated to stage the races and battles that the audience demands. The result is an experience akin to trying to mediate on a roller coaster, end quote. I thought that was a really nice way of describing what you were just saying about the big ideas and it trying to contend with the fact that this is really just a visual fest of a movie. Like, which one Which one is it? What are they doing? I mentioned in the intro that people were pretty divided on this movie. It has a 51% on Rotten Tomatoes. A lot of people that you talk to don't like this movie. It seems like it's liked by Tron fans, but casual fans were kind of put off for it. It's one or the other. It's very polarizing. Yeah. Just like the first movie, right? You like you either like the first movie or you don't. It made 400 million at the box office, but we mentioned like the budget was almost 200 million. It just didn't make enough money for them to justify the sequel. We mentioned this on a few different episodes. The budget that you see doesn't include the marketing costs and so we don't really know what Disney spent to promote this movie, but I'm not at all convinced this turned a profit. And that's that's why we never got the sequel. So Anton, I mean, that's anything you want to add here? I mean, we have our notes, the protagonist and the setting, the plot, the storytelling. These are all reasons why it wasn't better. Anything you want to add? I think um, one thing that really captures, like today, that really captures just how influential the vis- the visual style and like just how cool just the aesthetic of this film is and how, yeah. And how influential that is can be really seen um, with just what's happening over at Shanghai Disneyland. They have the actual Tron ride there and it is one of the most popular rides across Disney properties. So much so that it's actually really drawn a lot of buzz and interest and really has driven the momentum of putting out another sequel into the Tron film. So think about that. It's the ride, not any sequel like books or comics or any continuations there that have really drawn the buzz it's a ride so that's really speaking to the that's how influential just the the aesthetics are it's very cool and and that's what's really drawing people in so yes we can definitely look at the film and say okay was it trying to tell a deeper story um but wait it was very visually stunning at least we can all agree this was a very cool film and this was a oh, very, yeah. or a very cool like visual film, and um, I'm hoping that with the buzz of Shanghai Disneyland and the Tron ride there, I highly I, I would I would love to see uh, another sequel. I have some I have several pieces of good news for you. Oh, number one, the ride Tron just opened in Disney World in Florida. Oh, here we go. That's gonna go. Or, that's gonna open up. A- it either just opened or it's opening next month. Number two, we are getting a sequel. There we go. I don't know if it's the sequel that you want. It's called Tron Ares. It, it's officially moving forward. Uh, Jared Leto is going to be in it. Oh, great. Jared Leto. Yeah, it's it's going to be directed by Joachim Roning, who I didn't know who that was. Um. He is most famous for directing the box office flop Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. I don't even know if I saw that Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I think that this is just my take. I love I've loved what I've seen with different IPs getting like animated 
sequels or getting animated adaptations. For everything as stunning and visual as we're seeing here, I think it would do fantastic as with getting like a animated or like anime esque sequel. Did you ever see the the series Tron Uprising? It was on Disney XD about ten years ago. Never saw it. <laughs> it's it was only it was it's very good. You can find it on Disney Plus. I'd say the only negative is that it was canceled after one season, so it doesn't really tell a complete story. But it does fill the gap between what happens between the first and second movies. If yeah. if you like Tron I'll, enough, will, give it a shot. I will give it a shot. Thanks for the heads up. I yeah. I'll probably queue that up tonight. Uh, it's, but it's definitely pretty cool. So Anton, did you like this movie, in spite of all the issues you had with it? I did. I did really like it. I, uh, you and I were discussing this earlier. Um, I do find that, uh, despite its flaws plot wise and a, a lead actor that I definitely, definitely don't know what the studio was thinking there. I really, I really ended up enjoying myself and I can still think back to that, the opening scene and the voiceover by Jeff Bridges, and this music that just has such strong staying power. It is, uh, it was, it was for me, like I, I enjoyed this film. Is it a perfect film? No, I thought there, and we talked about what could have made it better, but for me, I still really, really enjoy this film to this day. What about your rating before I go? Oh, my rating. Right, right, right. I'm giving it a B. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, that is a lot higher than I thought you were going to rate this movie. Cause I know when you wanted to do this, I thought this was going to be our first like major disagreement. I'm quite fond of this film as well. We talked about the flaws, and I mentioned this earlier in the recording. My expectations were so low that I think it really helped my opinion of this movie. This movie exceeded all of my expectations pretty much every turn. I just wanted to be entertained. I absolutely was. And this is one of, if not the first Blu-rays that I ever purchased. If I had one IMAX movie that I could watch in theaters again, it would be this. It's such a unique and visual and audio feast that I'm willing to forgive the storytelling flaws. The story was silly in parts, but so was the original movie. I don't care for American Eagle model Garrett Hedlund either. But as far as spectacle and sound, this movie has it all. And it's a really fun movie to rewatch. It's completely immersive. I've probably seen it 20 times. And when I was rewatching it again to prepare for this episode, I still think it's impossibly cool. It's possible that I love the premise or like the concept of the movie greater than the film itself. But I think for a PG rated Disney movie, I don't know what more you can expect. Every aspect of the film is like a piece of a puzzle, right? You get the. the Sound, art direction, screenplay, acting, directing. This movie's definitely missing a few pieces, but I give it a B as well. I really like it. Very well it said. Very I well really said. enjoy rewatching it. And that's it for Tron Legacy. I guess we're recording these out of order. So our next movie, it's it's technically my turn to pick. I would like to take our first venture into the world of James Bond. Quantum of it. Solace. Let's start with the Daniel Craig right. era. Let's go. Let's figure out what uh, Quantum of Solace really means. There's a lot of debate about that one. It's the amount of comfort, you know? The certain amount of comfort that we all strive for. I feel like we achieved our Quantum of Solace with Tron Legacy. Oh, very agreed. Yeah. Well, that's it for this edition of Why Wasn't It Better, and we will see you next time.